In this video, I'll show you an overview of how you can create your own app fast, easy, and with the minimum amount of code possible. The final result is a dashboard with a list of your competitors' videos. With a dashboard like this, you can continue on building a filter system to order the videos whichever way you'd like. For example, you could place a filter to fetch only the ones from the past month and from those order them by relevancy to then find the trending topics or just throw away all this and create something else. But the idea here is to create an endpoint in NAN that allows your front end application in Lovable to access your database. Not only that, but I also want to include caching and pagination. These two simple features will allow your application to be much faster and drastically improve the user's experience. Pagination is basically a way for the client to communicate to the server which part of the data it wants, in which order, and how much of it. This part of the JSON request is asking for the first page, limited to 10 rows and in descending order, based on the publish time. This way it knows exactly what to fetch in the database, allowing the app to fetch each batch of video data as the user scrolls down, instead of loading all the data at once. Now, if you were to receive the exact same request repeatedly, it's not very efficient to look at the database every single time. So we're going to create a string to represent that request and check our cache to see if we already have that data available. And if it's available, we immediately get that data and send it back to the client skipping the entire database filtering part. Now, this is really just an example of how you can make the front end built inside of Lovable to communicate over with your NAN, which will act as a background service fetching from the database. So whatever you really have inside of your database can serve as an example for us to fetch over and then represent it in the front end. This is really dynamic because each database will have its own tables and each tables will have its own schemas. So I'll try to show how you can fit this workflow for your specific needs. But if you want to follow along and just use the same YouTube outlier detector, which sends everything over to the database in the same schema, you can use this workflow that I hosted up in NAN templates. I've actually improved this workflow a lot, especially for the AI Forge Pro community. This entire workflow right here, it sends things over Telegram. It, you can ask inside of Telegram for the new outliers and then it will send that back to you. And I also recorded the entire live build for this integration over at the AI Forge Pro as well. Lovable plus NAN integration. If you're in there, just head over to this section and you'll be able to see 38 minutes of me creating this entire application. Now here's kind of a disclaimer because there are a lot of code bros out there that might see this video and see maybe if I place something in, in the thumbnail, like build anything with NAN along with Lovable, they might say, no, you can't build anything because it's, it won't be scalable at all. And that is true, but you can get to a point where you built the MVP. You can validate your ID. You can build a lot with this. Even if you're just building a lead magnet, this is awesome. It gives a lot of value. This project, for example, was built just for myself. It's an interface where I can track my competitors. This won't be available for anyone else. And as soon as I add some filters here, it will be much faster to just look through this dashboard instead of going through each channel to get each video's data. So just making a brief comment about scaling because that's an issue for most people when they want to start out. They start thinking, hey, maybe these dev bros uh, are right and I shouldn't even get started with that. Let me hire a developer instead. That, that, that's not really true. So for my example, I have a hosting or VPS with two vCPU cores, eight gigabytes of RAM, 100 gigabytes of NVMe disk space, eight terabytes bandwidth. This is more than enough for you to have up to like from 70 to 100 concurrent users. And I'm not talking about having 100 users at your website at the same time. I'm talking about even if you have 10,000 users in your website, and that kind of depends where you're hosting the front end as well. And if you're caching the, the data from the front end. So yeah, the, the talk on scaling is a much huger topic. The, the thing is, if 100 of the users that is in your websites try to fetch the data all at the same time, maybe your website will be laggy, maybe it will take more time to retrieve the data and be sure to always use the queue mode from NAN to scale things up. But honestly, if you get to the point where scaling is an issue, it may not actually be an issue. It might be a blessing because your your ideas validated and there's a lot of people visiting your website. So at this point, you would then consider hiring a developer to take on the job and actually make your website scalable. So enough talking, this is the workflow, just this. And I'm going to explain each and every single node. What you have to understand here is that this has an endpoint. So this URL right here that we set, so the production URL set by the webhook node 
has a path of slash API slash video statistics. This is basically going to be a connection that Lovable, the front end, is going to communicate and then it will execute the workflow. As the workflow executes, the final node, which is the respond to webhook, will then get the data that you want and respond back to the Lovable interface with the data requested. So yeah, the first node is the webhook node. You'll set it to a get HTTP method. The path, you can choose whatever you'd like, but always remember this path, especially when you're instructing Lovable to use that path. Authentication, we won't be using any authentication for now, but if the user needed to log in this website to get this data, you would likely set this authentication up. Finally, go over to the respond field and check using respond to webhook node. This is basically telling the workflow to respond with the respond to webhook node instead of it just finishing and then responding with whatever the final node outputs. Now for this code node, I named it parse query parameters. What it does is basically parse out the response and get only what you want to continue on the workflow. You don't need data like, let's go over to the executions. Uh, let me F5 inside of this page. You'll notice that it's basically going to fetch, like hit this endpoint and fetch whatever it needs. So that's what it did right now. And we'll get exactly this. We don't need all this, at least not for now. So we're just filtering and getting only the params, the query, the body. Not only that, but we're also going to create the cache key. This cache key is basically getting everything and grouping them together to then ask the following node, which will be the Redis node. Redis is basically what we're going to use to cache things. And it's going to use that cache key and fetch it over inside of Redis. Because if this was fetched before, like this example right here, like the last one, it was a cached example. And that's why it skipped the true route right here. And this is what happened. It fetched for this specific key, and this was the data brought back because it actually found that data since it was cached. Now, this example down here wasn't cached, so what it returned was a null. And based on what the Redis node responded, so in this case, it was cached, so it found something, it's not null, this falling node identifies that structure, uses adjacent parsing, and adds the from cache parameter as true because then we follow up to the if node, this if node is basically looking at this from cache parameter and deciding, okay, we have something cached or we don't have something cached. If we do have something cached, then go directly on to the response to webhook node and respond back the data to the user. That will avoid us going through all of these other nodes, which is basically filtering out the data from the, the Postgres database, finding the total amount, merging everything together, and then structuring them on, which is what we'll see when it goes through the true route. Now, for your specific case, maybe the parse query parameters node won't have these type of filters. So channel ID, sent status, date from, date to, or minimum views. And to make sure it's using the correct parameters and knowing what it can use to filter out from your own table, you can run this command right here. So all you need to do is place the table name down here and execute this node. It will give you the complete schema and the context needed for an LLM to instruct you how you should create that JavaScript code. The prompt could be something like generate a JavaScript code that validates a GET request and outputs the correct structure with pagination, data sorting, data filtering based on the table schema, and a cache key based on the request. Now for this code node right here, it should be the same for everyone because it's basically trying to identify if we have a cache hit or not. Same for the IF node, but then it gets really different for the Postgres nodes. This one up here, and I'm showing it from an execution perspective, it's basically gathering all the filtering we got. So the pagination, the sorting, the filters, and finding them all inside of the database, which retrieves the 10 items we asked filtered the way we want it to. Now, I did forget to mention that while prompting to create this code node right here, you should send over the schema for your table, as well as for creating the query for this node. So the prompt I used was, Based on this JSON input, which is basically this one right here, and you'll send this over to the LLM, please provide me a Postgres query to filter through and retrieve the desired data from my table named, and then you place the name of your table, which has this schema. And then you'll basically send over the schema that you got from this node right here. 
As for this node down here, you're basically trying to find out what is the total count based on what was filtered, because this way you give a better context for the pagination over to the front end. And the prompt I created for this one was very much the same. So I send over what is my input. And I say, based on this JSON input, please provide me a Postgres query to fetch in my table named this, the total count of data found when filtered. After that, we'll get to the merge node, which is basically merging everything together into a single sequence of objects inside an array. This divides them into 11 different items for this case, because I want 10 items in each call for the pagination. So make sure that this code node right here is set to run once for all items, or else it's going to loop through each and every single item running this code, which is not what we want. We basically want it to get all that previous code and then place it all together at which we'll call the Redis node that is now caching that received data. I'm using the exact same key that we tried fetching previously because then this guarantees that the next time it'll fetch for this specific key, it will find it cached and then it will use the cache. And then for the value, I basically stringify all the JSON that I received in here so that this is carefully stored inside of the Redis cache. I also set this to expire after 3,600 seconds. So this is equivalent to an hour. This is the time that our cached data will stay cached before it, it trying to revalidate. And this is really important because in some situations like for this one, for example, if I were running the update in my backend for new videos every, let's say minute, and then in my front end, I'm just seeing this after an hour, then it won't be updated and that wouldn't be efficient. If I'm searching for these videos every 24 hours, it wouldn't make sense for me to be caching this every hour because why would it fetch new data after an hour if I'm just updating the data after 24 hours? And that's basically it for our NAN workflow. We connect the final insert cache node over to the respond to webhook node, which is just, just plain simple. Now this was my prompt over to Lovable to retrieve this exact result. As you can see here, I just sent two messages. So one was the main prompt and the other one was just, there's no need to show the YouTube title since I didn't get that from the YouTube API. So let's go through each part of this prompt because there's like dynamic data that should be for your specific case. And I'll show you just in a bit how you can get that specific data. Please create a web interface with a neo brutalizer style. I, I believe the right way to say it is neo brutalism, but it understood pretty well. That shows YouTube videos from my competitors. You will fetch for it using this endpoint. So the first thing is the endpoint. This endpoint right here, you can find it over at the webhook node. Go over to production URL. And for this production URL to work, you need to toggle this active. Then I continue on saying that this is an example of a CRL that can be used. Observe the available filters. This is so that Lovable can understand what are the available filters. And the way we can get those available filters is by sending over to an LLM this prompt right here. Based on this code, which is a parser code, please provide me a get CRL. And that code is right over here. We already structured everything. We, we know the filters based on what we created for this code node. So if it's effectively working, we can just get it, send it over, and then it will understand what it's trying to filter and likely create a URL that is effective for that. This is the URL. And then you pass over the same URL because obviously to try to make that same request, you need to have the URL. And this is my table schema. So the table schema is just useful because it understands which order it could use. Let's copy this over. Let me send it here. And while this is running, English isn't my first language. So I'm wondering if it's pronounced CURL or curl. So now we got a bunch of different commands we can send. Let's choose request specific page and limit. Let's choose that. Let me open up my CMD, paste that in. As I read through it, what it's basically trying to reach is just the page as well as a limit. Let me send that, that over. And this is exactly what I got. Because of this output, I can also copy down this output. And that's exactly what I sent down here. But before I get to that part, this isn't exactly the curl that we're looking for because it doesn't have all the filterings we want. Let's go over to Gemini and let's find some place that it's actually using all the available filters. Down here, it seems like it's using a combined request. So get page three, five items per page for a random channel. 
where sent is false, sorted by like count. So th that's a lot of different filterings. And the thing is that if we send this over, we're likely to not get the exact response, like any videos off of it. Let me clear that out, hit enter again. We didn't get any videos, but that's probably because it's trying to filter from a date where we don't have any data for that specific date, or maybe because it's using this channel ID that we don't even have this channel ID in our database. But this is likely a structure that Lovable can rely on because it won't just use the static part of this. So it won't always limit by 10, always limit by page one, always limit by a minimum views of 100. It's going to understand everything that it's possible while trying to search things because despite me sending this over like that, every time I request, since I'm not trying to filter any information exactly, I'm just ordering things, it sends all these parameters as null because it understands that the only thing I want is an ordered structured of the response for each one of these different elements. Then continuing on the prompt I have in the main dashboard, don't filter anything, just fetch for all the videos. Remember to place a limit because of the pagination. Also create a very well performing pagination that works on scroll. When the user gets to a certain part of the page, it then fetches for 10 more results and displays it. While it's fetching, use skeletons in the UI to demonstrate the loading process. So, so this should be like this. It should be well, really well described for the LLM inside of lovable to understand what you want from it. And it's pretty interesting that you explain like that because then it will know how to fetch for that data from our backend. Follow along with the data comes back like this and then paste in precisely the response that you get from that curl. I ended just saying position each video as a card with its respective thumbnail and all the information available. So that's how we got to this pretty nice result as it's loading, it's loading with the skeletons and successfully making each call. Now, if you're here more because of the YouTube outliers aspect, I would recommend you to check out TubeLab. This website is pretty interesting. It, it, this, this is not a sponsored video. They didn't sponsor me to do this. It's just because I really enjoyed what I saw here. All the data gathered by this website and how they try to estimate an RPM is pretty interesting. And you can get some insights on what type of channel, what ch type of niche you should be creating. So if you have your own YouTube channel, you can place in the link for it down here. It will personalize and try to find everything that matches the context of the YouTube channel. As we hit continue, you'll get a bunch of outliers inside of your own industry for your specific niche. And then down here in the filterings, which was what I mentioned earlier that we could get to a point of implementing that in Lovable, we can select a recency of let's say month. And there's also monetization, rarity, outliers, views, multiplier. We can filter all, all that, but let's just select a month filtering and then sort by yeah, actually relevancy is pretty neat. And then we get a bunch of different results, mainly results from Nick because he is absolutely crushing it out there. That is it for today. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comment sections. Leave a like if this helped you and consider subscribing if you're not subscribed yet. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Till then.